All right, engineers, in this video, we're going to continue on with our discussion about fatty acid oxidation. So if you guys already watched the first part of this video, it was specifically discussing the process of beta oxidation that was occurring in different tissue cells like the heart or like the muscles or the like skeletal muscles or even the liver or many, many tissues that this could be occurring in. But what we didn't get to describe yet is how much energy is actually being produced, a little mnemonic that we're going to discuss also to remember the beta oxidative pathways, and then other pathways that can occur specifically with peroxisomes and odd chain fatty acids. Okay, so let's get back here, and since we've already covered this, we don't really need to do a serious, serious uh, in-depth uh, conversation about this because we've already gone through it. So we're going to kind of fly through this really quick, guys. So if you guys remember, we had polymethylic acid, which is again, how many carbons? 16 carbon fatty acid. What did we do? We converted him into palmitalyl coa So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say that we're going to have over here palmitoyl coa How was this reaction happening? If you remember, there was an enzyme that was doing this reaction. That enzyme was called fatty acyl coa synthetase. So that enzyme was called fatty acyl coa synthetase enzyme. And what was this enzyme doing? It was taking and adding in a coenzyme A, but in order to do that, it costs energy. So because it costs energy, what do we have to do? We have to specifically utilize the breaking of ATP. So what did we do in that step? We took ATP and we broke it into ADP in inorganic phosphate. And whenever we did that, we utilized that energy from breaking that bond to add the coenzyme A to make palmitoyl oil, palmitoyl oil coa. Then we said that there was a specific transporter here, and that was called CAT1, or you remember you can call it carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1 or carnitine acyl transferase 1. It's all dependent upon preference. And you guys remember that it added on a specific molecule and pulled off this coenzyme A. So if you guys remember, I'll draw the reaction here. Here's the reaction, it's moving into the cell. When it moves into the cell, what does this molecule do? It adds on carnitine. But when it adds on the carnitine, what does it get rid of as a result? It gets rid of the coenzyme A. And then it gets brought in as what? Now this molecule is called fatty or palmitoyl carnitine. So it's called palmitoyl carnitine. This palmitoyl carnitine molecule, what happens with him? Remember there was another uh, specific type of transporter that was on the inside of the mitochondrial membrane, closer to the mitochondrial matrix, while this was on the cytosolic side. This one was called CAT2, or CPT2, because you remember you can call it carnitine acyl transferase type 2 or carnitine palmitoyl transferase type 2. And what does this one do? Remember that it pushes the carnitine back out to get recycled, and then instead it takes and adds on a coenzyme A. So it adds on a coenzyme A. When it does that, what's the overall result of this reaction? Out of this we get palmitoyl CoA. Then what did we do? We went through a series of steps, four steps. And this was the steps. Now, let me give you a little mnemonic to remember all of these steps. So we're gonna have four steps here. Let's do that first. Let's put one, two, three, four. Okay, I like to remember this mnemonic. Let's write this one out. First one is going to be O. H O T. I like to remember O hot. So what does O hot stand for? O stands for oxidation. Hot stands for hydration. O stands for another oxidation step. And then T stands for thiolase. And if you guys remember what was happening in each one of these series of reactions. If you guys remember in the first step of the reaction, we had what molecule coming into here? We had, N, I'm sorry, FAD2, FADH2. Now you might be saying, okay, well Zach, I remember that this one had 
NAD positive to NADH. If they're both getting oxidized, how do I remember which one goes which, or which one goes first? You know there's an F in FAD, and there's an F in first? So FAD is going to come first in this reaction. And then, what was happening in this second step? And as a result, you guys remember, from this reaction, from this reaction, you get the trans delta 2 in oil, CoA. Then what? Then we added in water. And when we added the water into this reaction, we got what? We got specifically beta hydroxy acyl CoA. Beta hydroxy acyl CoA. Then what happened? He got acted on by NAD positive to NADH to form a carbonyl. And remember that carbonyl was a ketone, so we called it beta keto acyl CoA. Beta keto acyl CoA. And then what happened? In this last step, this is where that thiolase enzyme comes in. Remember the thiolase enzyme? What was he doing? He was splitting the between the alpha and the beta carbon. When he was splitting between the alpha and the beta carbon, what happened as a result? One thing is I make a new specific a fatty acyl CoA. So I make another fatty acyl CoA. But this fatty acyl CoA is going to be two carbons short. Remember how specifically what was happening here? Remember I had a 16 carbon, this palmatilio, palmatilio CoA with 16 carbons? What's going to happen is I'm going to, I'm going to regenerate another fatty acyl CoA. But the problem is, is that that fatty acyl CoA is no longer going to be 16 carbons, he's going to be 14 carbons. But then guess what? He'll go back into this process. And when he goes back in and gets recycled, he'll go through the same process again and break off into another 12, and then into 10, 8, 6, 4, 2, 0. Okay? You keep breaking these guys down. But what did I tell you was the most significant part of this? What was the other product here that we got that was really, really important? Acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA. Okay, now you're, at, you're probably wondering, okay, this was an acetyl-CoA, and let's actually make that green so that we stay consistent with the CoAs here. CoA, with that thiol group. You're saying, okay, this was an acetyl-CoA, and this is a fatty acetyl-CoA, but I only had one CoA here this thiolase adds a CoA into this reaction. So this thiolase not only cleaves between the alpha and the beta carbon to give you a 14 carbon fatty acetyl CoA, but it also gives you acetyl CoA. Now, the question is, is what can happen with that acetyl CoA? Okay, if I keep doing that beta oxidation like we talked about before, how many acetyl CoAs would I produce from a 16 carbon fatty acid? As a result, I would produce a total of, let's take this over here, think about it, 16 carbons, I'm breaking them into two carbon fragments. So what's 16 divided by two? Eight. So I'm producing a total of eight acetyl-CoAs. Now, you guys have to come back for a second and remember the Krebs cycle. Remember in the Krebs cycle, whenever we went through the Krebs cycle, you produced a whole bunch of NADHs and FADH2s? Remember, for one acetyl-CoA, how many NADHs did you produce, guys? You produced two, I'm sorry, three NADHs. Three NADHs, and then you produce one FADH2, and you also produce one ATP by substrate phosphorylation. For, from one acetyl-CoA, you make three NADHs. If you have eight acetyl-CoAs, how many NADHs would I make? I would make 24, because eight times three is gonna give me 24. Then, if I have one FADH2 for one acetyl-CoAs, eight acetyl-CoAs would give me eight FADH2s. And this would also give me eight ATPs. Okay, now the next question is, this is only from that acetyl-CoA. What about the NADHs and the FADH2s that we generate from this part here? Okay, so this happens, uh, you're gonna undergo how many rounds of beta oxidation? That's the key question. Remember I told you, you're only undergoing seven rounds of beta oxidation. 
When you undergo those seven rounds of beta oxidation, how many FADH2s and how many NADHs am I actually going to make from this reaction? From here, I'm going to get a specific amount of NADHs and I'm going to get a specific amount of FADH2s from this beta oxidative pathway. Okay, so how many? How many FADH2s and how many NADHs am I going to get out of this? Okay, well remember I told you you have seven rounds of beta oxidation. So in seven rounds of beta oxidation, these reactions are only going to occur seven times. So I'm going to get seven of these guys and seven of these guys. So that's going to give me seven FADH2s and that's going to give me seven NADHs. Hmm, this is awesome. Okay, but here's the next thing. We can't forget about that one ATP that we used up in order to activate the fatty acid. So we'll come back to that and we'll tally it all up. Okay, so let's say we take a 16 carbon fatty acid. How much energy would we be able to produce? Well, let's tally everything up. All right, so now if I add together right here, look how many NADHs do we have? We have 24 that we produce from the A to C to CoA. And then we have seven NADHs that we generated from that beta oxidative pathway. So seven plus 24 is going to be a total of 31 NADHs. So now, from this, I'm going to have a total of 31 NADHs, okay? I get eight FADH2s from the acetyl-CoA, from these eight acetyl-CoA, and then I get seven FADH2s from this beta oxidative pathway. So seven plus eight is going to be 15. So then I get 15 FADH2s. Then, you're also going to have to account for the eight ATP that I made by substrate level phosphorylation. So now I'm gonna add in those eight ATP that I got from substrate level phosphorylation. But then here's the next thing. You have to subtract the ATP that you utilized in order to activate the fatty acid. So now we have to subtract one ATP from all of this. So whenever we get from here, we're gonna to have to subtract this one ATP from it. Okay, so let's put a line across here. Okay, now the next question is, one NADH is gonna be specifically three ATP. So, if I take this and I multiply this by three, because that's how many ATP I'll get. So what is 31 times three? That's gonna give me three, that's gonna give me how many? It's gonna give me specifically 93 ATP. So this is gonna be three times one, uh, one three. Three times three is nine, I'm gonna get 93 ATP from those 31 NADHs. Then, 15 FADH2s. If you remember, FADH2 gives you two ATP. So again, what's 15 times two? That's gonna give me how many? 30 ATP. Okay, so now I'm gonna have 30 ATP here. Plus, don't forget about the eight ATP that I got by substrate level phosphorylation. So now I have 93 plus 30 plus 8. So if we take all of that and sum that up, what's 93 plus 30 plus 8? So 93 plus 30 plus 8. We're going to get 3 plus 8 is going to be 1. Carry that 1 over. 9 plus 1 is going to be 10. 10 plus 3 is going to be 131. So that's going to give me how many? 131 ATP. But then, this is how much we get. Uh, we'll say gross, right? But then don't forget to subtract the ATP that it required in order to, what is this for? Activate the fatty acid. So in order to activate the fatty acid. So now you have to subtract that one ATP. So now what is completely left over as a result for your net gain? Your net gain of ATP from this process is gonna be how much? 130 ATP. That is absolutely insane. To make 130 ATP from this actual 16 carbon fatty acid, which is palmitoyl CoA. That's why they say that specifically, fats are such a high concentrated source of energy because they can produce significantly large amounts of ATP, okay? So from that, we were able to calculate how much ATP we generated from the 16 carbon fatty acid. We did a little quick review of the beta oxidative pathway. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna come over here and we're gonna look at another pathway which is gonna be oxidizing specifically odd chain fatty acids. Okay, 
So now we understand specifically how much ATP that we totally produce. And again, here's the thing, guys. Certain textbooks and certain literature will say that the NADH uh, actually accounts for not exactly three, it's like 2.5. And they'll also say that FADH2 actually doesn't account for two, it's actually 1.5. Now, if I'm just rounding it to three, and I'm rounding this FADH2 to two, then I'll get 130 ATP by rounding it. But if we were to be really particular, because some of you guys might get into your textbook and say, oh, Zach, that doesn't make any sense. Well, just in case you look in your textbook, if I were to do this, it's 31 times 2.5. So I'll make it here in red. If I made this 2.5, and then I made this one, instead of making it three, I made it 1.5 then actually, after I subtract everything, my overall total, we'll keep this one here as the rounded. We'll keep this one here as the rounded, but I'll write down below it. If you were to utilize those values of 2.5 and 1.5, you're actually going to get 108 ATP. Okay? Okay, so just in case you guys are looking into your literature, you might see 108 ATP from this actual reaction here accounting for the 2.5 instead of 3 and the 1.5 instead of 2 and then again if you actually have to subtract this ATP you're also going to have to get about 107 ATP because you're going to have to subtract it from that point there too. Okay so now that we've done that now what we're going to do is we're going to take and look at these odd chain fatty acids and how they're being oxidized because they're a little bit different. So odd chain fatty acids, obviously you know what odd chain means. It just means that it's not you know, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. These ones could be instead of like 16, it could be a 15 carbon fatty acid. So let's say I have a 15 carbon fatty acid here. If I have a 15 carbon fatty acid and I bring this 15 carbon fatty acid into the actual mitochondria. And then as a result, I take this 15 carbon fatty acid through rounds of beta oxidation. And when I go through this process of beta oxidation, I give off a three carbon group at the end of it. And that three carbon group that I form is called propionyl CoA. Now, here's the thing. Most of them were going into what? When you were undergoing this beta oxidative process, most of them were producing acetyl CoA. Most of them were being produced into this. But what happens is, is whenever you're breaking one of those actual last bonds, you're getting rid of acetyl-CoA and a propionyl-CoA. That propionyl-CoA is gonna have to go through a different process to be utilized for energy. So what happens is the propionyl-CoA is actually gonna be acted on by a special enzyme. And this process is gonna require ATP. So I'm actually gonna have to utilize ATP in this process. And the reason I'm gonna have to utilize ATP okay, is I'm going to have to do some type of special mechanism where we're gonna add another carbon into this guy. So this is, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this propionyl-CoA and I'm gonna add another carbon into it. So in order for me to do that, I have to have a special enzyme that can do that process. Usually enzymes that are adding carbon dioxides or carbons in are gonna be called carboxylases. So this enzyme is called propionyl-CoA carboxylase. Now what's interesting about this enzyme is this enzyme, not only is he catalyzing the step and adding a carbon in the form of usually the CO2, so usually you're going to add a carbon in the form of CO2. This enzyme, he's stimulating the step, right? He also is consisting of a very important vitamin called biotin. So this is one of our complex B vitamins and it's very, very necessary in order for this enzyme to function. So the propionyl-CoA carboxylase is going to be doing what? It's going to be adding in a carbon and breaking this ATP into the ADP and inorganic phosphate. And there also is going to be some bicarb that can go into this reaction also. So I can even put that if I need to here. I'll put bicarbonate actually is going into this reaction also. Usually that's the form of how we're actually adding the CO2, is we're actually adding in the form of the bicarb. Now, this propionyl-CoA, when it reacts with the bicarb and ATP to give you ADP and inorganic phosphate, in the presence of this enzyme, propionyl-CoA carboxylase, which needs biotin as, to be present, what it's going to do is it's going to convert this propionyl-CoA into methylmalonyl-CoA. So it's going to break it into what's called methyl 
malonyl CoA. And usually there's two different forms. Technically there's a D form, and then what will happen is that methyl malonyl CoA will undergo a different mutation reaction where it'll get converted into the L form. So there is two different forms of the methyl malonyl CoA, one in the D form, one in the L form. Not really relevant here. What is relevant is this next step. I'm going to take this methyl malonyl CoA and I'm going to feed it into a specific step of the Krebs cycle. And you guys have probably seen this uh, Krebs cycle intermediate before, I would assume. The enzyme that's catalyzing this step is very, very dependent upon vitamin B12. But this enzyme is called methyl malonyl CoA mutase. So it's called methyl malonyl CoA mutase enzyme. And this enzyme, what he's going to be doing is he's going to shuffle around this structure to be able to produce a very important molecule. And this molecule that he'll be producing is called succinyl CoA. And I already told you guys that this guy is a Krebs cycle intermediate. So what can happen with that succinyl CoA? I can te technically take this succinyl CoA and I can convert him into two different things. One is I can convert him eventually into oxaloacetate. And if you guys remember anything about oxaloacetate, remember he can be hidden in the form of malate. And when he's hidden in the form of malate, he can get shuffled out here. So here's our, let's say this is the form of malate. Remember that malate can get converted back into oxaloacetate. And then what can happen with oxaloacetate? If you guys remember, there's a special enzyme called PEPCK, and PEPCK was converting the oxaloacetate into phosphoenol pyruvate. And then what can happen? He can eventually go up to make glucose. And if he eventually goes up to make glucose, what is that called? When I took a non-carbohydrate source and turned it into glucose, this is called gluconeogenesis. So this can lead to gluconeo genesis. Okay. So now we have gluconeogenesis occurring here, which is coming from these odd chain fatty acids, right? So this 15 carbon, or let me put here right next to it, what is this again? This is a odd chain fatty acid. This reaction is producing acetyl-CoA molecules, but as a result it's producing a three carbon fragment called propionyl-CoA. Propionyl-CoA is being acted on by propionyl-CoA carboxylase, which needs biotin. It's adding in bicarbonate for that, that extra carbon that it's going to be adding in, and this reaction requires ATP. It produces methyl malonyl-CoA, which can shuffle between the D form, dextrorotary, into the L form, levorotary form. Not significant in this process, but it is acted on by a mutase enzyme, a methyl malonyl-CoA mutase enzyme. Okay, so now, in order for this to happen, we require vitamin B12. So B12 is very, very important for this reaction to occur. Another thing that can happen with the succinyl-CoA is you know that he can continue throughout the Krebs cycle. So if he continues throughout the Krebs cycle, what's another uh, significant function of this guy? So technically he can go to form ATP. He can go into forming ATP. Right, because he can continue to go through the Krebs cycle and be utilized to make NADHs and FADH2s, take those through the electron transport chain and make ATP. One more interesting function of this guy. He can also be utilized to make porphyrins. Specifically, porphyrins, porphyrins, and heme groups. And this heme and porphyrins are important because where have you heard the word heme or porphyrin molecules before? Hemoglobin. So this is, in, this is actually can help to make what molecule? Hemoglobin. So you guys can realize how significant this process is. Any breakdown in this process of succinyl-CoA being able to make heme or porphyrins, which is consistent within the hemoglobin structure, can cause detrimental effects on the body. One of them you've probably heard of is called pernicious anemia, which is the lack of vitamin B12, usually due to the lack of a protein produced by our stomach called intrinsic factor. Okay, so this is one of the ways that we can deal with these odd chain fatty acids. So the ultimate result of odd chain fatty acid oxidation is what? I can eventually make succinyl coa What are the destinations of succinyl coa One is I can make glucose. 
through gluconeogenesis. The second one is I could actually continue throughout the Krebs cycle and produce ATP. And then the other one is I could take it and actually use it as a precursor to make heme groups and porphyrins, which is necessary for hemoglobin. And again, remember that this step here to do that, convert the methylmalonyl-CoA into succinyl-CoA requires vitamin B12. Okay, now the last thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the metabolism of these fats within peroxisomes. Okay, so let's come over here now. So this structure is specifically a peroxisome. So this is a peroxisome. Now, peroxisomes play a very, very tiny uh, role but they do have, they do, nonetheless, they are important within the fatty acid oxidation, but they're not as significant as compared to the amount of fatty acid oxidation that's occurring within the mitochondria. Now, the steps in this peroxisome are almost exactly identical. There's just one step that really differs significantly, and that's the one that we'll talk about. It's actually the first step of beta oxidation. So let's go straight to that step. But what, here's something that you gotta realize. This peroxisomes, they do have transporters to bring specific types of fatty acids into this structure, which is kind of interesting. But again, this is important that these do have transporters on the peroxisome to bring the fatty acids in. So let's say that I bring these fatty acids in. So let's say I put F fatty acids. But specifically, this should be what? It should technically be this fatty acids that I'm gonna have here. I should have a CoA on them, right? But they're gonna come in fatty Acyl CoA in. Once we have this fatty acyl CoA in, what's going to happen? You know, it's going to undergo the similar steps of beta oxidation, but it, with the exception of one specific step. In the first step, if you guys remember, remember we had FAD, and FAD was reacting with this fatty acyl CoA and picking up the hydride ions. And when it was picking up the hydride ions, it was being converted into FADH2. And then if you remember, FADH2 generally in the actual mitochondria will take those electrons to the electron transport chain to be utilized for energy. In the peroxisomes, there's something different. They actually take oxygen, okay, plus water and react that with the FADH2. And what's happening is the FADH2 has those electrons, right? he's going to react with those guys and regenerate the FAD. As a result though, when this oxygen and water gain those electrons, they get converted into a new molecule which is called H2O2, which is called hydrogen peroxide. So this molecule is called hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is extremely, you know, it can be extremely dangerous on our body. And the reason why is because it can act like a free radical and it can cause a lot of damage to our DNA and proteins. It can cause a lot of oxidative damage. So what happens is inside of these peroxisomes, they have special enzymes to deal with that hydrogen peroxide. So say I take this hydrogen peroxide and I bring it down here. What happens is, is I take this H2O2, this hydrogen peroxide, and I'm gonna have a special enzyme this enzyme is called catalase. So let's say I have here an enzyme, and this enzyme is called catalase. And what this catalase enzyme is going to do is, it's going to work through a specific reaction to break up the hydrogen peroxide and convert it back into oxygen and water. So I'm going to take this hydrogen peroxide and convert it back into oxygen and water. And then what will happen? They'll go back in, remove that, F, they remove the electrons off of the FADH2 and convert back into hydrogen peroxide. That's the whole purpose. And that's because peroxisomes do generate a lot of hydrogen peroxide for certain types of cellular functions. But this is the main significant difference is that within the first step of fatty acid oxidation inside of the peroxisomes, the only real difference is instead, whenever they generate these FADH2s in the peroxisomes, they don't have an electron transport chain. They take and drop it onto oxygen and H2O to make hydrogen peroxide, which can perform certain cellular functions within inside of the body. But to prevent this from causing excessive uh, damage to our cells because it can act like a free radical, what happens? We take that hydrogen peroxide and we react it with catalases. When we react it with a catalase enzyme, it converts it back into oxygen and water. Okay. Now, last thing I want to talk about, guys, in this video is I want to talk about certain types of disorders in which certain enzymes within the body are not functioning correctly. The most common one that I want to talk about that is extremely dangerous is actually called 
medium chain acyl dehydrogenase deficiency. They actually refer to it as MCAD deficiency. And what happens in MCAD deficiency is that they're obviously not having an enzyme called what? Medium chain acyl dehydrogenase. You know the acyl-CoA dehydrogenase enzyme is very, very important within inside of this pathway? If they're lacking this enzyme, think about what can happen inside of the body. So let's come over here to this actual pathway over here. Imagine we're lacking a specific enzyme in this pathway, specifically right around this point, this acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. If we're lacking that, then we can't generate this uh, trans-delta-2 enoil-CoA, and we can't carry out the rest of the beta-oxidative processes. So what happens is these fatty acetyl-CoAs start building up, and they start building up and building up and building up within the liver. As these fatty acetyl-CoAs build up in the liver, they cause extreme damage to the body, right? So what's some of the signs of someone who has MCAD? One is they're gonna have lipid accumulation. So they're gonna have high lipid accumulation, mainly in the tissues of the liver. This is usually gonna be in the liver, but it can occur in different cells. But one of the dangerous ones is lipid accumulation in the liver. And again, what is this for? This is for MCAD deficiency, okay? That's one dangerous thing. The next dangerous thing is they have hypoglycemia. These individuals also have hypoglycemia because it throws off other reactions in the body due to this MCAD deficiency. And you know what can happen whenever you have severe hypoglycemia and lipid accumulation in the liver? It can cause extreme vomiting. So some of the signs of these people is that they're going to have signs of vomiting. They're gonna be extremely sleepy, very, very sleepy. And it can get so bad to where it can actually put them into comatose. Okay, that's one. Another one that I wanna mention is over here with the peroxisomes. Now, with the peroxisomes, remember I told you that these, uh, these transporters are responsible for bringing certain types of fatty acids into this actual peroxisome? There is a condition in which there is a deficiency within those transporters. If you have a deficiency in these transporters, can you bring the fatty acids in? No, and so the lipids start actually accumulating in the blood. And whenever the, so what is this actual condition called? This condition is called X-linked Adrenal leuco dystrophy. Now, as you can tell, it's X-linked. What does that mean? It's more common in boys. Usually, it's a common in, and more common in boys before the age of 10. So it's more common in boys before the age of 10 years old. Now, what happens with these people? Well, one thing I told you is they don't have the transporters to bring the fatty acids in. Not only is that gonna happen, that they can't bring the fatty acids in and undergo beta oxidation, but what can happen is that these actual fats can start building up in the blood. So as these fatty acids, so some of the actual signs of this person, is that they're gonna have high fatty acids in the blood, hyperlipidemia. When there's high fatty acid levels in the blood, this can cause disastrous effects on the body. Some of the effects that it can actually cause, it can cause visual disturbances, it can actually cause visual disturbances. It can also cause significant behavioral disturbances. And it can also cause coma. And even significant death. And obviously if untreated, it can lead to death. Now, another thing that you can actually derive from this name, look at this name that actually can come from it, which can explain some of the neurological problems. You hear the word adrenal leuco. Leuco means white. So you know there's white matter within the, the actual central nervous system? In this condition, there is actually no, not gonna be as heavily myelination. So you know the white matter is actually myelinated axons. In X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy, they're actually not having myelination of their axons, which can cause significant damage. Another one is adrenal. Their adrenal gland is also gonna be damaged. Because of the adrenal gland being damaged, that also can affect a lot of hormones being produced from that organ. So, there's X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy, which is gonna occur in boys below the uh, 10 years old, or MCAD deficiency. Oh, one other thing with MCAD deficiency, let's come back over here for a second. Because they have high lipid accumulation, right, and they're lacking a specific enzyme that can actually break down these fatty acids, 
you want to avoid this person from ever having uh, to have to utilize or break down fatty acids. So what is the treatment for these people? Usually one of the treatments is that you try to give them a high carb diet. Put them on a high carb diet to avoid and stay away from fats. If you put them on a high carb diet which avoids taking in the fats, it's going to help to prevent this breakdown of fats. The next thing that can also you're going to want to do is you're going to want to specifically be able to um, actually have decreasing time intervals between eating. And that's going to help with this process also. Last but not least, there is one last disorder we're not going to spend a lot of time, but there is a condition in which you can't make these peroxisomes. And whenever you're not making these peroxisomes, it can cause multiple disastrous effects on the body, not just with related to fatty, oxida fatty acid oxidation, but other different types of conditions. And this, whenever you're not able to make these peroxisomes functionally, it's called Zellweger syndrome. Okay. All right, engineers, so in this video we covered a lot of information. We went over uh, just basically review of the beta oxidation pathway and the activation of the transport. We went over the energy tally with respect to just rounding. And I, I remember I rounded it within this video to give us the, a simpler idea of how much ATP, but if you did take into consideration the 2.5 and the 1.5, it'll give you a little bit of a different answer around 108. We talked about specifically the actual oxidation of odd chain fatty acids with relationship to succinyl-CoA and how that can be utilized in certain processes. And we talked about the fatty acid oxidation and how it differs in peroxisomes, as well as MCAD deficiency, X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy, as well as Zellweger syndrome. All right, engineers, I hope all of this made sense. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I really, really hope it helped, guys. All right, engineers, until next time.